it. I always want to plug my book. I'll just throw, hold it up here, Lost Men and Meth. Uh, it's it's our, probably the book on uh, what we're calling uh, fused uh, or paired drug and sex addiction and uh, or chemsex, where the two really go hand in hand. And I think that's what's really exciting for me is that we're opening really the first unit, certainly in the United States, and I think the first unit in the world that is really dedicated to doing just that, to dealing with that issue that can be among gay men or straight men or uh, women for that matter, but largely men. So anyway. Uh, the thing that we're gonna do is, nice. is adult. Adult. Pardon me? Our, the treatment center is gonna be for adult males only, at least in the beginning, correct? Right, I was gonna say the problem occurs for both genders, but our, we're, we're dealing with just men at this point. Hopefully we'll expand that in the future. Um, so uh, one of the, the uh, pleasures of hosting this webinar is that I get to pick the topic. And I can usually pick a topic and have a little discussion about things that um, are useful to me. Uh, so and it's not all about me, but I did want to pick the topic tonight. And that's basically stress management. I think um, I have, I'm in a period of stress. I think a lot of us are. And I think probably anybody dealing with addiction, including those affected by addiction, uh, encounter a lot of stress. And so I want to kind of frame it a little bit and then give just some stress management strategies that I, I do in terms of addiction or, or life, and then uh, we'll turn it over. And as usual, if people have comments about something that's not on this topic, we'll, we'll follow where you want to go because this is uh, your webinar. So if you look at a literature about stressful events, you know, they're all the things you would think of a spouse's death or uh, a divorce or a separation or a death of a close relative. Um, and I think that misses a couple things that we kind of gloss over as being stressful events. Uh, one would be good stress. I know we've talked about that in this webinar before, but uh, sometimes getting a promotion at work, getting the big job, getting married, having a baby, all those things are equally stressful. And uh, there was a scale a couple of years ago that assigned points to different things. And, and uh, getting married and having a baby we're right up there with, with uh, having a death in the family or losing a spouse. So I think sometimes we don't think of happy events as being stressful, but they certainly are. Um, and the other thing that I think uh, is the same thing with trauma. We think of um, very severe extreme events as being uh, the source of that. But I think we have to also pay attention to chronic stress um, of the kind that's kind of low grade, you know, not getting enough sleep for weeks or years at a time. Um, working two jobs, or constantly worried about money, having um, someone uh, who has some kind of illness in the family, having an addiction in the family, being an addict. I mean, all these things are kind of chronic. Um, I wouldn't even call them low grade because they can be very um, intense at times. But I think it's really important to recognize that these uh, things are equally stressful um, as the big major tragic life events. So um, that's something. I think the other thing too that we're finding out now with scientific literature is that a number of physical ailments are stress related. Um, and so I, there's, I've seen statistics between 70, 75, 90% of doctor visits are related to kind of stress in some way. And they can be for cancer or diabetes or um, immune problems, cardiovascular disease. Many of those things have their roots in stress. So it's really incumbent on us to learn how to manage it effectively as I can. So um, the first one, I have, I think, five of these. The first strategy, I would say, is just avoid unnecessary stress, right? I think sometimes um, there, we can't obviously control all our stress in life. Things happen, things happen far beyond our control. But um, sometimes uh, we can. Sometimes there are things uh, that we can do to reduce the stress, like learning how to say no. Um, and I had that today. I'm, I'm very busy tomorrow before I leave for... Uh, a number of weeks uh, travel, and um, my the wife of my own college roommate is in town. Haven't seen her in a long time. She wants to have lunch, and I really would love to see her, but I just it would make my life kind of unmanageable and stressful to drive 20 miles and back, and, and with all the other day I had to do. So um, I, I waited on, on, my, on my behalf. <laughs> so I decided I'm not going to do that because it would just be too stressful. Um, another way to avoid it is avoiding people who stress you out. You know, there are people that um, take, take a lot of energy from us uh, just by the, by the interaction of them. So I think sometimes we can um, be selective or uh, put up some boundaries with people. Um, another way to do it is to take control of environment. Sometimes um, I, I can't sit down and write or really work if my desk is too sloppy and that causes me stress. Uh, so I kind of sometimes have to 
put, put things away or file or take 10 minutes just to kind of get things in order so my mind can. Uh, can. And then the final thing on un avoiding unnecessary stress, I think everyone does, is, is making a to-do list that's like on steroids. And I think we really have to pare down the to-do list so, it's not, so we're not setting ourselves up to failure, right? So that's one thing, avoiding unnecessary stress. Um, um, the situation, uh, sometimes uh, that can be done with compromise. Uh, by being more assertive, by changing our communication style. Uh, sometimes we can learn how to manage our time better uh, in terms of altering the situation. Uh, sometimes we can uh, take a brave step of maybe expressing our feelings instead of bottling them up. So in other words, what, what different things, how can we approach this problem in a different way that could be helpful for us? Um, another thing I do is kind of reframe. Uh, and that's, a, I guess, a therapist word we use a lot. But basically, it's kind of looking at the big picture, kind of taking, taking a step back and seeing um, how these things kind of fit together. And, and another thing I've talked about a lot in these webinars in that regard of, of adapting to it is um, really focusing on the positive. And we, when we're bombarded with so many different uh, data points coming at us, I think sometimes we get overwhelmed and start to just see everything that's wrong. And I think it's a habit that uh, can really limit how we see the world. And so, so just focusing on the positive. Um, another one, and this is something that's familiar to program people, is accept the things you can't change, right? We have this great little slogan uh, called the Serenity Prayer and program that, that talks about just this, you know, really evaluating, okay, what can we control, what can't we, and kind of releasing it. And so I think that ability to accept the things we cannot change um, is a huge, for me, it was a huge relief. And I still fall into the trap of control sometimes and, and, um, but I think I've hopefully learned not to try to control the uncontrollable as much as I used to. I think sometimes we, we dive in there and, and fight it out and uh, can lose ourselves in there. Um, look for the upside. I think uh, another way to accept the things you can't change really is to share your feelings, to, to express it. I think, I think it's not enough, at least for me, to kind of just make that decision in my head, but I have to do something with it. It may mean, uh, physically releasing uh, something. It may mean sharing my feelings with somebody uh, just to kind of do something with it. Because what happens, um, uh, I'm kind of an avoidant personality, I think. So I'll just kind of let things sit before I make a decision kind of while I'm kind of figuring it out. And, and that just really um, lets things accumulate to the point where it gets unmanageable. So I um, have found it necessary to kind of take action uh, and sometimes the action is, I'll, I'll decide on this tomorrow. But, but I always want it to be a conscious decision as opposed to just letting things happen because I just never got around to or, or avoided making a decision. So uh, that's one thing. And then two more things kind of on the upside. And those, for those of you familiar with the, the boundary plans we have in, in uh, section of recovery, these are, these are the outer boundary things. Um, one is making time for fun and relaxation. I think so many of us get caught up in this um, need, and it's not, we're not making stuff up. I mean, our lives are very busy. We have a lot of demands on us. We have a lot of stress. Um, a lot of us are caring for parents and caring for children and uh, worrying about things and, and uh, have a lot on our plate. So I think it's really important to find time to invest in ourselves for relaxation. And uh, I'm a terrible person to say that because I tend to work too hard, but I think with this constant struggle for me, in fact, I will tell you, in a, in a therapy group once, I was assigned to take myself and my partner to Disneyland and have fun, <laughs> to uh, celebrate my inner child. So uh, I'm really kind of in a remedial program for, for self-care in terms of that. I've gotten better. But I think that trying to find the time for relaxation and connecting with others, and we've harped on this in these webinars too, connection is really the key and is what keeps us resilient. Um, I try to do something I enjoy every day, and that may be some of a small bit of time with sitting down. I like to play piano, sitting down at the piano for 15 minutes, or taking a nice walk, or playing an extra long time with my dogs, or whatever. But I think to really indulge in that, and and I feel I feel guilty about it sometimes because I have work to do. But it's 15 minutes, and I think it, I'm a, I do much better work if I can do that. And then finally, just healthy lifestyles. Again, that kind of outer boundary stuff. Exercise regularly. Uh, eat a healthy diet. Um, reduce sugar, reduce caffeine, uh, avoid alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs, obviously, if you're in recovery, um, that's important. 
and sleep. I think sleep's important too. So, um, so those are all kinds of, I'll, I'll recap the, the headlines there real quick to talk about these strategies. Um, one is to avoid unnecessary stress. One is to alter the situation if you can, like uh, by speaking up or being willing to compromise or being assertive. Um, one is to adapt, uh, and I may not have read that off, but adapting would be reframing, looking at the big picture, um, focusing on the positive, uh, accepting things we can't change, making time for fun and relaxation, and living as healthy a lifestyle as we can. So all of that, of course, is directly related to addiction and recovery. And, uh, addiction is kind of a double-edged sword in this because it not only contributes to a lot of the stress, um, but addiction is a reaction to the stress too. So uh, we kind of get a double whammy with addiction because if we're, if we're highly stressed out, um, a lot of people turn to mood altering chemicals or behaviors to uh, reduce that level of stress, to kind of check out from it, dissociate from it. And then of course addiction can uh, inevitably create a lot of stress on, on its own. So that's uh, kind of a quick recap of some of the ways I do stress management. Um, I've done a different webinar on resilience, but I'll just close by saying, I think a lot of people look at stress as just um, a situation that just exceeds our ability to uh, handle it with the resources we have in, in terms of resilience. It kind of overloads our circuitry. And um, these are ways to either um, reduce the stress, change how we deal with it, or generally kind of find balance in our lives. So I would love to hear um, how people handle stress, what they do, um, the way we've, we do this, you can um, speak, uh, you can put your questions in the chat room, or the, rather, rather the Q&A, right, ideally, Scott? And then yeah, the chat is public for everyone. Yeah, uh, Q&A is better. Yeah, so feel free to jump in. Um, while we wait on questions to show up here, um, one of the things I, I had to do very early in my recovery um, because it was stressing me out and it was going to take me, take me out um, based on the stress was uh, my sponsor very clearly and strongly said, stop watching the news on TV. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's advice that I, I follow almost 20 years later now. Um, I, I, you know, if I click it on for 10 minutes, my stress, my blood pressure goes up, my stress level goes up. It's unnecessary stress for me. Um, I'm much better getting the headlines off the internet. Um, as soon as I turn that TV on, I'm sucked in and, uh, and I'm just angry, you know, <laughs> unhappy, mad, um, you know, want to fix things. Um, so yeah, and I, I also liked um, that you mentioned the serenity prayer. That's another tool that I use when I'm really, really stressed, um, particularly, um, around work, um, which has been very stressful for David and I, we're getting ready to open a treatment center. It's a lot of work. Um, and, I, you know, I remind myself of a couple things, you know, I, I, um, you know, sort of adapt and alter, you know, I reframe, this is a good thing. I'm happy to be doing this work. This is something I wanted to do for a long time. And, you know, I want to be part of this. Um, and then the serenity prayer is, you know, the workload isn't going away. I can't change it. What I can change is my attitude, um, and and you know, and I know the difference between the workload, which is fixed, and my attitude, which is not, um, and and that just helps me manage uh, that stress and you know life in general. Um, and then the, one of the other things that I do is um, my my Tuesday night group last night. Um, sometimes we have a meeting where we do. Um, it's a bunch of guys. So uh, ESPN is, a, is an acronym we can remember. Um, and we, we use ESPN for our check-in. How are we doing emotionally, spiritually, physically, and then with intimacy, uh, which is kind of a stretch on the end. But um, and we were all doing, we had one of those meetings last night. And as I was checking in, I, you know, I saw my day a lot more clearly. Um, I had been working since 6.30 in the morning. I had knocked off work at 20 minutes to 7 at night to get to my 7 o'clock meeting, and I was planning to finish the project I was working on after the meeting. And as I heard myself checking in, I thought, oh, that is just such a bad idea. Um, I need to 
do something fun when I get home. I need to play with the cat. Um, I, I need to eat some chocolate. Um, you know, I need to watch some bad TV. Um, and as soon as that, as soon as I realized that, all the stress that I had been carrying all day went away. Um, and then I did much better work this morning when I got back to it. Um, so I, I like that you mentioned that. Sometimes um, we have to sharpen the saw a little bit so it'll work better. Right. A couple of things. I, I love the fact you brought up TV because that's, I think for a lot of us, um, that's been a real struggle the past couple of years. And I think I know just for myself, if I start to turn on the TV, it, there's an addictive kind of rush to it. I get, I get engaged and I get angry, I get, and I can't stop looking at it, you know? And so I think for me, uh, and for me it's very toxic, and so I also limit it, uh, and never ever before I go to sleep. And that's one thing I tell clients always, just to, the last hour before you go to sleep should certainly not be anything stimulating like that, or controversial or upsetting, but really just kind of calm, gentle, soothing stuff. Um, and the other thing I just uh, it really reminded me of the the work days. You know, I'm on the East Coast, and the rest of our team is in California or on the West Coast in Arizona, California. And so I, I'm up like at eight o'clock working um, on the East Coast, and it's all quiet because everybody's asleep <laughs> out there. And then around noon, things start to light up, and the day goes. And by six, you know, I've had a really long day. I'm ready, to, and there's still stuff coming in. And so it goes to nine or ten at night. And so I've had to really learn how to um, have boundaries and, and say, okay, that's going to have to wait till tomorrow morning uh, because I've been had a 12 hour day. So uh, taking care of ourselves, right? It comes down to that. So yeah, great example, Scott. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so you can, everybody, you can ask questions about anything. It doesn't have to be about stress management. Um, so just pop something in the Q and A. David and I'll talk all day if you let us, but uh, we, we do this so we can answer your questions, um, not so we can dominate the conversation. Right. Right. So um, you also, you, and you talk about this a lot um, while we uh, send us some questions, people. Um, focusing on the positive. Um, and it, that's, in my experience, that can be really, really hard for partners whose addicted spouse or partner is still in it and for addicts when they're either still in it or new to recovery. Um, is, that, is that your experience, David, um, working with people? Yeah, I think that's certainly generally true and, and for good reason. I mean, there's a lot of uh, negative feelings and upsetting events and, and things like that in those situations. Um, because those situations, though, tend to last a while sometimes until change occurs, I think it's really important for uh, especially partners to be able to learn how to um, take care of themselves in the middle of that crisis. And that may be, even though things are unresolved, to um, share feelings if you can't do it with your partner, with, with a friend or with your therapist, to make sure you take care of yourself physically and eat well and do all those kind of things. Um, in terms of actually seeing the positive, that can be a real struggle, but I think it's really possible. Um, sometimes it, one way I do that, because when I can't kind of come up with anything, if I'm in a real gloomy spot, um, just the, me the mechanics of doing a gratitude list can really be effective for me. And, a, and not a huge one, I'll do five things. And um, just the process of starting to think about it uh, can sort of start to change my mood. And then suddenly I realize, you know, I'm not alone. I'm not, uh, you know, a, an overwhelmed victim. I'm not all this stuff. I have resources. I have friends. I have uh, me. And I think... Um, that that ability to do that it's and it's probably the most challenging situation of all, all to do that when you're in crisis or when your family's in crisis but uh, it's really an, an important skill to learn how to um, take care of oneself in the midst of a bad situation it's really important and yeah I'm, I'm, yeah i'm glad you mentioned gratitude list because that's another one of my go-to techniques um when it was very, very hard, uh, which goes back to my earlier comment, when I was new, I, I couldn't come up with one thing to put on a gratitude list, let alone 10, and let alone 10 things different today than what I did yesterday. Um, you know, and, you know, I would do things like, well, you know, the air is relatively clean today. You know, I'm not coughing. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and look, we've got a couple questions coming in. The first one's a comment. Um, 
one of uh, the people says um, she's in Southern California where the super bloom is. Um, so she's taking advantage of getting out to the flowers as often as she can. Um, uh, it, those of you who don't live in Southern California probably don't know what a super bloom is, but this is kind of a desert. And when we get a bunch of rain, which we did this year, uh, the spring flowers, the wildflowers are just, just stunning. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you're doing that. Um, I'm going to try and do it this weekend. Um, okay, so we've got a question here. Um, I just started to practice mindfulness meditation about three months ago. Uh, it has helped me to get more aware of my feelings. Are there specific things you have done to use meditation to specifically help with sex addiction? Wow, that's a great question. So mindfulness meditation is different things to different people, but for me it's a very simple um, being still, focusing on the present, not kind of being pulled back into uh, something that happened yesterday or worrying about tomorrow, but just really being right here. And it can be very mundane. You're right here listening to the fan go or watching the cat play or, or my stomach's growling because I'm hungry. And just noticing in a very non-judgmental way. So, so that skill turns out to be tremendously powerful in terms of actually reworking the brain um, and rewiring the brain and helping healing um, that's to the damage done by addiction. Uh, mindfulness is really a very powerful way to, to restore uh, some of the brain's functionality and, and our emotional balance. Um, so with sex addiction particularly, um, I'm not sure uh, if you're the addict or the partner, it doesn't really matter, although, but with sex addiction um, and drug addiction, true, but I think in my experience, sex addiction and stimulant addiction have very, very powerful uh, draws. And once, once they kind of get into that primal part of your brain, it's very easy to become obsessed and really driven and they kind of hijack your life with everything else. Mindfulness uh, in its, all its, its simplicity is a very, very powerful way to, um, to not fall into that trap. Or if you do kind of go off the rails to, to bring yourself back. It's, it's kind of a, uh, like a way to just kind of not go on autopilot, but it, but it kind of lets your brain do what it knows how to do. And, and uh, mindfulness, I think we have to overthink it, but just kind of do it. And it's absolutely helpful for, uh, for triggers and for cravings and for, um, uh, I think Scott, in your example, you may have mentioned something like this where uh, just by being mindful, uh, you become aware of your feelings. You know, like at the check-in in your group, just like, yeah. just think about it. Suddenly you realize, oh, you know, I'm, I was really hurt by something somebody said three days ago and it hadn't even occurred to me, but, but just kind of creating a quiet space in your head where things can come and um, in medication, a lot of people get frustrated because the, you know, they have what they call monkey mind. You know, your mind is bouncing around all, this, all these thoughts. And that's really the point of meditation. Uh, the point is meditation is to purify those, to let them come up and release them. And that's the, that's the trick here. You don't want to try to keep your mind quiet. You just, when things, come across your mind, you want to let it keep going, just, just let it pass through. And I think that's um, very beautiful and a, and a very powerful thing to do. But I think with sex addiction particularly, uh, mindfulness is, is a really powerful technique. And Scott, I don't yeah. know if you want to share anything Yeah, I, I, I often, um, when i am got the monkey mind going, um, I look down and ask, where are my feet? And I look where my feet are, and that says, okay, I'm in my office right now. Why am I in, I'm on, I'm in my office? Because I'm on a webinar. Why am I on a webinar? Because it's important to me. <laughs> you know, and, and that grounds me and will bring me back into the moment. And the monkey mind kind of goes into the background a little bit. Um, so, and I, I think that kind of runs us right into our next question, um, which is what techniques do sex addicts use to deal with erotic sexual thoughts and fantasies that pop in their mind? especially any period of abstinence um, when they're trying to avoid sex, porn, masturbation, et cetera. Good okay, question. so one of the things we know is that um, erotic thoughts and sexual thoughts are gonna pop in your mind no matter what, right? So um, we're not really responsible for um, those thoughts. It's like a dream. If you have a bad dream, uh, you're not responsible for the creation of that dream. Um, and the same with these thoughts, they, they pop in our minds work in certain ways. What we are responsible for is what we do with that and how we handle that. And, and um, there's different ways to do that. Some people have like a three second rule with porn where if they come across an image or a triggering image or uh, something that could be triggering rather than linger on it, 
they they move on. They make a conscious choice to to move uh, forward. So I think um, that not actually it's similar to what we just said about not hanging on to that monkey mind stuff in meditation. Just letting it go uh, when you when you're triggered, not to focus on it, not to linger on it. Um, I think also to uh, sometimes distract yourself. I think it's good to just change your mind if if things come up, you can't shake it. Uh, I think it's important to get up and move, do something physical, do something different, uh, get out, connect with the sky or connect with the earth and just kind of ground yourself and, and use that opportunity to kind of remember why you're in recovery. What are you doing this for? And, and what are the benefits you've received from it? And again, kind of what we said before about reframing, putting it into perspective uh, in terms of um, how that works. Um, I think also it's useful to share to talk about them in a non-triggering way, but I think to call a sponsor, to call a friend, to uh, sometimes those things kind of take over our heads and it's really hard to release them or give it away. And I think it's very helpful to be able to pick up the phone or, or to get hold of somebody and, and say what's going on. And that uh, there's an old expression, not scientifically valid, but, but the, in spirit, it's certainly true. And that's, if you give something away, the power of it reduces by half and give it away again, it's by down to a quarter. And, um, but I think the, the concept is quite accurate in that the more we talk about something, um, the more diffused it gets and the less power it has over us. And again, that's another stress release thing, just to tie it back to that, where kind of we take control of the situation, right? We're not, we're not a victim to it. We're not um, passive about these thoughts coming to our head. We, we have an obligation to ourselves to, to handle them properly and to uh, take care of them. So um, yeah, it's about being mindful of those, about being responsible. It's about um, knowing uh, where, where the triggers are. There's a um, wonderful kind of diagram, uh, um, I think Patrick Carnes did it, uh, of sort of a relapse, right? And, and, a, and a ball at the top of a hill and uh, a boulder. And boulder. the law of physics, right? If it rolls off the hill, the, the longer it goes, the, the faster it gets the momentum and the harder it is to stop. And those thoughts pop into your head, you're standing at the top of that pretty hill, right? And, and you're not in danger, but I think the more you entertain them, uh, it starts to go over the, over the edge and, and can pick up steam. So it's really, it's not the sort of thing we just ignore or play around with or try to manage, but, um, but to really take care of that. And I think especially, as you said, in that time of, of sexual uh, of abstinence uh, from sex or masturbation, um, it's going to be natural for those thoughts to come up. And it's really critical to have a plan um, with your sponsor and, and uh, who's your program in terms of what, what your inner circle is, what your middle circle is, just to, so you know um, kind of where you stand. Because some behaviors may be uh, absolutely out of bounds. Some people, some may be tricky. Uh, so, you know, in a gray area that, that are risky. So it's, it's important to have that boundary plan up to date and be fully aware and, and very highly personalized. Yeah. yeah, I love that you brought up the, the boulder at the top of the hill. You know, it's teetering. And, you know, in my experience as a sex addict, I've got, once I become aware of that thought, I've got about three seconds to stop it. And that's why sex addicts, we have the three second rule. Um, uh, Dr. Rob always suggests, you know, if you're objectifying some woman who walked past you on the street, think about her as somebody's sister or her daughter or mother. And would you want somebody objectifying your own sister or daughter or mother that way? Um, you know, that'll get you out of it pretty quick, uh, hopefully. Um, you know, for me, it's just do something else within three seconds. Um, one of the things about the three second rule is, you know, you get rid of a thought and it'll come back 10 seconds later. You got to use the three second rule again. The more you do that, the better you get at it, um, number one. And number two, that thought loses its power when you don't act on it. So actually having to recurringly use the three second rule over and over and over and over and over actually takes power away from the thought that's, that's driving you into the three second rule, um, which is, um, you know, it can be frustrating when it's when you're, when you're trying not to think about it and it keeps pop, popping back into your head. But um, a nice way to reframe it, uh, to go back to our earlier discussion, is to think about it as you're taking power away from that fantasy by not acting on it. Um, 
And there are lots of other techniques. Some people put rubber bands around their wrist and they'll snap the rubber band, you know, which you hopefully hurts enough to make you think about something else. Um, and, you know, I carry um, a list of my outer boundary, you know, healthy activities that I wanted to use to replace my sexual acting out. I carried that list in my wallet for years um, so that I could pull it out and say, oh, I can do this. I'm here and I can do this um, instead of playing with this fantasy. Um, I, I want to say one thing um, about how our brains work in terms of uh, the negative or not. You know, so I think uh, it's really virtually impossible for us as human beings if we're told not to think about something, not to think about it. I mean, we, we go there, right? It's, it's uh, the brain like can't, the brain ignores or jumps over the word not in the, in the sentence and just goes to whatever the object is that we're trying to avoid. And I think so by one mistake people make is by focusing on uh, worrying about what they're not supposed to be thinking about. And, and that just, there's a thing I remember in driver's training back in high school there, the guy was saying, you know, you're, the car goes where you look. So if you're kind of looking over there, the car is going to drift that direction. I think if we're trying not to do something all the time, it's actually giving a power. So I think it's, it's useful to have um, kind of an opposite thing, a positive thing, an affirming thing to kind of plug into that thought and, and neutralize it. And as Scott says, you may have to do that over and over again, which is, can be discouraging early on, but it's, a, it's actually you're, you're building that muscle to learn yeah. how to do it. And that, that's why having outer boundary activities, whether it's calling somebody or going to a meeting or reading a recovery book or going you know, for a jog or playing with the dog or whatever, it's important to have those. And it's also important you know, reframing uh, whatever, whoever you're objectifying um, as a person. Um, you know, that was very important for me. Um, it was very difficult in the beginning. Um, I was much better in the beginning about just doing something else. Um, nowadays, I'll tend to reframe wh whoever I'm objectifying as a person, and and that that does a lot of that helps me a lot. But it took me a couple years to get to that point. So, um, we got another question here. Um, does spirituality play a role for you in stress management? I'm just curious because I'm trying to reconcile my religion and spirituality regarding addiction. Very common dilemma. Yeah, and great question. Um, I'll just say for me, I, did, I distinguish between religion and spirituality. Right? I think of religion as kind of organized religion um, and, and spirituality is, is much more amorphous and kind of personal for me. And I, I consider myself a very spiritual person, but not a particularly a religious person. And to answer your question in short, yes, absolutely. Uh, this spirituality for me um, is tremendously important for stress management. And it, it takes all kinds of forms. If I'm meditating, um, there's a, a visualization of, of letting a grounding cord go down into the earth, kind of anchoring. And just uh, that's part of my spiritual practice is to kind of be centered and get really focused and, and a chord that goes up. Um, and I just think, you know, and without getting too personal, I think it, it, it's an incredibly important because one of the concepts we haven't talked about tonight that is a great stress reducer, I think in addiction programs, 12 step programs, is the concept that there's something greater than us. Um, and I think that uh, an addict is such, uh, painfully trying to control everything um, often that's true of partners as well, just to try to get control of this desperate situation. And with all the bad things that happen in addiction, I think we kind of get alienated from, um, from any kind of sense of higher power, or spirituality, or religion. So I think that ability to reframe and, and uh, understand that, um, at least this is me speaking, I, I look at it as, as things that are kind of, I, I am one man in a very large system. And that system at first uh, for me was strictly my, my 12 step brothers and sisters, right? That was my uh, larger universe. And I, I thought, well, I can't trust me necessarily, uh, but I can trust the group. I can trust the, uh, these, these people and, and the wisdom, even if I didn't agree with it, or if it made no sense, I kind of surrendered that. And later uh, I was able to expand my idea of spirituality beyond the people in the room to maybe other things that I can't see or necessarily feel that may connect us all. So I think, and that to me, when I'm stressed, uh, I go there. And I think that's tremendously powerful and useful. So, uh, so I encourage people to, uh, if they have any kind of spiritual um, 
desire to kind of figure it out for themselves and, and really use it as a tool. For me, it's, it's not something to uh, drag out on Sunday morning for an hour or, or Friday night or whatever your faith may be, but to really just employ it um, every, every minute of the day if I can, uh, or certainly if I'm under stress, uh, to, to pull that out and, and remind myself. Um, it gives perspective to me uh, and kind of to my problems. Uh, so that's kind of a long-winded answer, but um, I think spirituality is really important. And I think it's something um, that may be a great webinar topic. I, I kind of shy away from it because I don't want to step on people's toes and, and it gets tricky. But um, there's room in this world for um, a million kinds of spirituality, you know? And I think uh, there's, some, there's some concepts I think that they all have in common, but that's caring for one another, caring for ourselves and, and uh, love and kindness, um, which is one of the reasons I don't watch the news too much. Uh, so yeah, spirituality plays a role for sure. Yeah, and I, I like that um, the person who asked the question is working to reconcile their religion and a version of spirituality. Um, you know, over the years, my my version of spirituality or my spiritual connection has evolved. Um, it looks very different today than it did ten years ago or fifteen years ago. I, you know, I I started out with the Force from Star Wars because I could understand that. Um, you know, um, and you know, it had been part of my life since I was ten years old. Uh, you know, that sort of concept. I could wrap my head around it. I couldn't wrap my head around church. Um, because they were just, I just couldn't do it. Um, you know, it's, it's very different now. You know, you know, a lot of people freak out when they walk into a 12 step program and they see the word God listed in the 12 steps. But what they don't notice is, is it says God. And then in italics, it says, as we understand God, you know, and I always ask or don't because I don't. Um, and that's fine. Um, you know, I've learned that there's something out there bigger than me. And, and that's really all that matters. You know, it's being a sex addict is a very narcissistic, selfish thing. And realizing I'm not the center of the universe was big for me. I think one of the things that's important in this area is that uh, religion, as opposed to spirituality, but, but organized religion so often looks at addiction as a moral issue. And I think that's a lot of the reconciliation I had to do too, that judging, um, the morality of being a bad person. And, and I think we know just every day we're getting new information. You know, addiction is a medical disease. It's a, it's a medical problem, not a moral one. And so I think, but a lot of us have been kind of scarred by um, uh, an upbringing that is very judgmental and harsh. And that leaves us with this kind of uh, looking at ourselves as kind of moral failure somehow. And I think uh, that keeps a lot of people from getting well. So I'd really, encourage um, you to remember addiction is a medical issue that, that causes a lot of pain for people, uh, obviously for the addict and for their partners and their families and everybody around them. But, but it's not a moral failing, it's a medical problem. Um, we've got another question here um, about a very stressful thing that happens to a lot of sex addicts early in recovery. Um, the question is, in the early stages of recovery, what is the best way to handle text messages from former sexual partners? Um, well, I would tell my clients to change their number. Um, I, that's, that's one of the really uh, disruptive kinds of things that happen. If you're working your program and kind of out of the blue, um, something comes along, you can be triggered like that. Um, I think what I tell my clients at least who are in that phase of recovery is the best thing they can do is to kind of set up barriers between them and former people that may come out of the blue. I had a client recently who um, had nearly nine months clean and hadn't changed his number and, and an old using buddy texted him like at three o'clock in the morning and he didn't use, but he was triggered uh, to want to use. It's just that it was like he wasn't prepared for it. And so text messages particularly are really uh, problematic calls um, any kind of messaging. So I, I would encourage you to protect yourself as much as you can, block numbers, change, change your number, um, and, and have, as Scott, I think is brilliantly said, to have, have your list in your pocket of those, that outer boundary stuff, and, and including numbers of people you can call, contacts, 
Um, the, the essential strategy, I think, for me in that situation or any situation that is problematic is to have a plan before it ever occurs. And so you really want to think that through um, as it's happened here, you maybe, or, or you're talking about it, you're planning for it. But I think to never, well, we can never say never, but to minim, minimize the amount of surprises you get. And I think um, that's the one way to handle it. And if it does occur, if somebody sneaks through, um, I would have... Um, Early on, I still could do it. I don't have the list anymore in my wallet, but I had a list of several people that I had asked, can I call you 24 hours a day, any time of day? And they had said yes, and I had that list ready to go uh, if I needed it. So um, just have your resources at hand. The thing about getting a text message like that out of the blue is that it just it comes just like that, and, and we're not prepared for it. And it can really like get under, un, under all our um, defenses. And so just... Uh, be very cautious about that and, and I try, try changing your number. It's a pain, but uh, it, it works. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. I can't change my number because it's my work number and everybody knows that number. And I don't want to delete this person or block them because we've been friends forever and I don't want to lose that friendship. I hear this from sponsees repeatedly. Right, right. And our phones are kind of our identity, right? Our, our numbers, we carry it around with, that's who we are. But I think it, 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 this is where a, there's a slogan to talk about a selfish program, right? We have to really take care of ourselves. And, and I've had friends early on, I had to kind of put on sabbatical. You know, I, I had to say, or ask them not to contact me and, and kind of evaluate after six months and see. Um, so to put boundaries there as best you can. And to really, uh, the same thing goes, I have a lot of gay clients that, um, are used to uh, sexual hookup apps um, like Grinder and Scruff, and, these, and they, they can't imagine giving them up because that, that really is kind of um, the, the connective tissue of gay society are those stupid apps. And I think people just really struggle with giving them up, and it's a really smart idea to do that if you're a sex addict or a, or a chem sex addict, um, but they really struggle with that. And I just I encourage people just do it. I don't know, do you have an answer for your sponsees, Scott? What do you say? Um, usually what I tell them is, is exactly what you came up with, which is you put them on hiatus, say, you know, we've been friends for a really long time. I care about you. I don't want to lose your friendship, but I'm, I'm in addiction recovery. I'm just starting and I need you to leave me. I need you to go away for six months. And if, and what I tell my sponsees is if that person stays away for six months, they care about you, they're your friend. If they don't, you do not need them in your life um, and you better delete their number or block them or whatever. Right. Um, right. And, and, you know, and you know, if somebody won't leave you alone after you tell them what you're doing and why, that person is not your friend. They do not care about you. Um, right, absolutely. And I, I found um, at the end of that six month period, I often, wasn't particularly interested in that person anymore. I think that the choices we make with friends and, and partners sometimes uh, are not the ones we make in recovery. And so it, it puts perspective on that as well. And once people know you're in recovery, they're often not that interested in you, um, especially I find that with alcohol and drugs. Um, you know, when I, when I got sober from alcohol and drugs, my drinking and using buddies went away. They were just gone. You know, I'm not friends with them anymore, and I don't miss them, and I'm sure they don't miss me, um, because we really weren't friends. We just right. It's a statement about the nature of the friendship. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so we've got another one here. Um, it's still difficult to identify as a sex addict and a Christian. Uh, the main thing for me with chemical addiction was finding out I'm not alone in this universe. <coughs> um, that there is a being. <coughs> excuse me. That there is a being closer than any other human could be. Um, I don't know if that's a statement or a question or <laughs> I think it's just a statement. But, um, yeah, I think um, you are not alone. Um, there is a tremendously large community of people in recovery in the Christian community of sex, from sex addiction. Um, and that was something uh, kind of a surprise to me because I was not in that community. And then as I've been working in this field more, I, I realized there there are whole treatment centers, there's communities, there are books, including a, a book from, that was edited by Dr. Rob with, with another person uh, out of the doghouse, kind of a Christian version of that. So I think there's a, there's a number of resources and groups and support out there. 
So I, I guess my message to you is that you're absolutely not alone. Um, it, it's a huge issue, and it's being recognized in the churches more and more. And there's a lot of resources that, and books and, and groups, um, both online and in the real world. So, um, yeah, but I totally get it. I think probably because of some of the morality that we talked about before, I mean, there's some, um, it's not easy. Um, but I think uh, that connection, which you kind of hint at in the last part of your statement there, that we, we're not in this alone and we, can, we need to be connected, uh, both spiritually and, and in, in the flesh, I think, with our, our brothers and sisters around us, for sure. But you know, my point is, there's a whole body of literature out there for Christian sex addicts. So uh, take a look. Do we have resources on the site somewhere, Scott? Um, we have um, Out of the Doghouse for Christian Men listed on the site, and I think I have one other um, Christian-oriented book on the site. Um, you can just Google it or go onto Amazon and find those. I mean, it's not just the Christian community where, you know, there's, there's a problem with sex addiction. Um, the Jewish community and all of the really conservative religions have horrible problems with sex addiction. Right. Um, the repression and sex addiction, uh, you know, the, the trauma of repress, repression, especially sexual repression, can drive later life sex addiction, just, just period. Um, but also people who, you know, consider themselves, you know, Christians and good church goers or, you know, good temple goers or, or, or um, it's difficult to reconcile in, in the mind, I'm doing this while I'm, you know, supposedly believing this, you know, I'm sex addicts, we go against our value system. Um, our sex addiction, sex addiction escalates and we break our rules, our internal rules and values. And it, it's very distressing. Um, and there's a lot of shame around it. So, um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And shame, of course, is really the central feature of addiction. And it just really is a setup for for that shame, but uh, yeah, great, great comment. So we got a comment here too, and then we've got another question. Um, thanks for your input. I'm enjoying uh, this webinar uh, being new to sex addiction recovery, but not new to chemical addiction recovery. That's a really common path. Um, people get sober uh, from alcohol or drugs and then think, oh, my life isn't getting any better. And then they realize there's something else to deal with. You see that, David? Absolutely. And I think that's uh, really the, the uh, inspiration for this new program we're starting, which deals with those two issues at the same time. Because the traditional uh, alcohol treatment programs would assume any sexual acting out would resolve itself if the person got clean and sober. And if uh, they've really taken on the aspects of a sex addict, that behavior doesn't disappear. In fact, it often worsens. Or we have people... Um, many friends who uh, got in recovery from some kind of chemical and just switched, uh, switched to sex, switched to gambling, switched to credit cards, and it's still that same addictive uh, acting out, but just different, different focus. So um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true, the staging. And I think uh, the same principles apply across the board, right? So the, the behaviors may be different, but, um, and as we've been putting this program together for uh, fused drug and sex addiction, it's, I, I've always understood there are lots of parallels, but it's just, I can't believe how many parallels there are too, because I've really been um, trying to integrate Rob's sex addiction program with the one I'm creating, and it's, there, it's really the same stuff. Uh, you can really do it with almost no word changes. So uh, it's, it's a common phenomenon, a common process. And good for you for um, recognizing this. I think a lot of people think, uh, or make a deal with themselves, I'll give up alcohol, but I'm not giving up X, Y, Z, and, and that behavior um, certainly stops recovery and also often leads to relapse uh, on everything. Yeah, for, for a long time, I was playing whack-a-mole with my addictions, you know, and knock one down and boop, the other one would pop and knock that down. Boop, here comes the other one. Um, uh, Rob calls it changing seats on the Titanic. You know, new view, still sinking. Um, you know, I, I did that for a couple of years, um, which brings us to our next question. Have you ever experienced a relapse? Yes, I have. <laughs> I'll let David take that one. I don't think he has. <laughs> well, early on I did, uh, for sure. Um, I was struggling. I was fortunate. I, early on in my 20s, I, it stuck. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think probably uh, that's a very common experience. I, I, I don't know of anybody, I think, that probably 100% the first time through. I mean, I, um, and I, I my, my periods of sobriety were short and my relapses were frequent, um, the, but then I got it and, and that made a difference. And it, made, it was a matter for me of finding um, the right meetings, finding the right people. Uh, I uh, got, got sober in New York City. Um, I thought, um, although I didn't live on the Upper East Side, I thought I was kind of an Upper East Side kind of drunk, um, just a little classier than maybe some, and uh, I just could not get it. And finally ended up uh, in this meeting uh, at that time in a smoky church basement with a lot of raucous and uh, their, their annual group uh, celebration, their guns were pulled. I mean, it was that kind of craziness. And I loved it. That's where I, that's where I was. And, I, and that's not who I saw myself. That's where I got sober. So I think once I found the right place, my point in all this is once I found the right place, um, I was able to stick. And I was able to start working with people who could um, believe in me and hold space for me until I... Uh, got out of my craziness enough to to see that I could do it too. Um, I've had near misses uh, over the years, but thank God I've not relapsed per se. Um, and now I've had, I'll have, uh, well, my 40th anniversary is, is in May, and um, it seems almost inconceivable, but I'm also very well aware, because I've been around people who've had many, many years who got kind of complacent. And so uh, relapses, it's never that far out of my awareness in terms of my attitudes and, and everything. Yeah, I, I was, uh, my story is actually similar early on. I, I was just a revolving door for a year and a half, almost two years. Um, and what changed for me was my motivation. Um, I was in an alcohol relapse um, and I was in a bar and I had a, a very expensive, nasty tasting drink in my hand. And I looked at it and I, thought, and I just realized, and I'd been drinking for a couple of weeks at that point, and I couldn't get drunk. Um, I, I was not getting any relief from the alcohol. Um, and I knew, already knew that I wasn't getting any relief from the sexual behaviors and I wasn't getting any relief from the drugs, um, which was the draw. And, and, you know, it just wasn't working for me anymore. Um, so I put the drink down, I left, I went to a meeting the next day and, and, what I realized was that was the first time I'd ever gone to a meeting for me because I wanted to change my life. I had always, I had been going to meetings to keep a job, to keep people talking to me, to, you know, to keep my family, to convince my family that I was doing something about this huge mess I had become. Um, when I finally went to a meeting because I, I couldn't live that way anymore is my sobriety day. Um, so, but it, it took me a while to get there. So hopefully, hopefully you'll find it <laughs> sooner than I did. So, um, we've got a couple minutes left if, if anybody has another question. Um, we'll give them a second. David, did you want to say anything to wrap us up or in case we get another? Yeah, I think just, um... Stress is, to take it back to the original topic, stress is just such a pervasive thing that we all experience. And I think um, a lot of us have this belief that high levels of stress are just inevitable. And I, and I think that's where this concept of resilience is useful because there's stress out in the world. I'm not saying there isn't, but um, you know, the same thing can happen. You know, a terrible incident can happen to one person uh, who reacts in one way and the same thing can happen to another person who reacts in a very different way. And, and so you look at what's the difference and some of it's, it, I think most of it is resilience and an ability to process whatever this event is, to handle it, to manage it, to, um, uh, and I'm not saying just handle it on, the, on their own, to, to be able to ask for help, to be able to get help, to be able to be connected, to have, uh, have people in your corner, to get information, to share, to, um, to play with if just to get away from it, you know? So I think uh, it's that ability to kind of call on resources and some of the techniques we talked about in the beginning to, to diffuse the stress. Um, stress is like inevitable, right? It's gonna be with all of us till we stress out and leave this earth. Um, but, but how we man manage it and handle it is the, is the key. 
And, and then to me, that's not any kind of, like resilience, I think a lot of people mistake resilience as a character trait and resilience as a skill. And managing stress is a skill too. It's something we all can do and we can learn how to do it and, and we can always do it better. So uh, I encourage people to, uh, if they're feeling stressed, to take it into their own hands um, and take action. And the action may be to decide not to do anything today uh, or it may be to change something. Uh, that's where that serenity prayer is really useful, just for guidance. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, David. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to remind everybody we have um, webinars and drop-in groups every day, but Saturday now. Um, we also have free podcasts that you can listen to, um, and we have blogs and all kinds of things, um, self-tests to see if you're a sex addict um, or if you're a, a chem sex addict. Um, uh, on the on the website and check out our seekingintegrity.com website um, which has everything about our treatment programs and also some some really cool information there too so uh, David will be back on this space in two weeks next week um, at this time we have Nero Roski um, and we'll see you then thank you everybody for coming thanks everyone have a good evening take care Scott All right. see you soon <laughs>